Hey everybody, it's Matt. Welcome or welcome back to the Journey Church Podcast. If you haven't yet, be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you can automatically get our weekly episodes. And you might want to go ahead and subscribe to our Journey YouTube channel as well. You'll find messages, music, interviews, inspiring stories, and more for you all right there. Now, I hope this episode helps you take your next step in following Jesus. Today, I need you to buckle up because we've got an interesting message to talk about, all right? So just giving you a little warning. Everybody settle in and buckle up. Today is part two of the series we're in called Who Needs God? Who Needs God? And the thing about um, today is you're going to really need to focus. I'm going to need you to think. I'm going to need you to try to stay locked in for a minute, because which may mean you have to put your phone on Do Not Disturb or AirDrop or whatever. Uh, it tends to distract you. That's fine. But today... Today you need to try to lock in because we're going to talk about something that I guarantee you, you have had a conversation about with somebody at some point in the last year. You have been in, you've heard conversations, you've been in the middle of debates about this. This is one of those things that is a hot button issue today. We're going to talk about the question, who needs Jesus to define their identity? In other words, who really needs Jesus to figure out who they are? Can't you figure that out without him? Now, I do not have to tell you that this idea of of identity has been at the center of our national conversations, national controversies, debates, discussions, you name it. There's a lot going on around this in our nation today. As I was preparing for this, I started thinking about, just over the last couple of months, some of the conversations around identity that I have heard. I came up with eight right off the top of my head. I know there are more. But as I was thinking about it, I was like, oh, yeah, this is everywhere I turn. We're currently in our country having debates around racial identity, sexual identity, gender identity, family identity, body identity, geographical identity. You're like, what do I mean by that? Well, um, if you're from the South or the Midwest, what do you think about those East Coast and West Coast people? That's what I'm talking about. Everybody tends to, you know, they're pointing fingers to each other. Generational identity, which is... You know, the difference between boomers and Gen Xers and Gen Zers and millennials and on and on. Everybody points fingers with generations. Religious identity. I mean, you know this. This is dominating our conversation today, which means it's an extremely emotional issue. It's an extremely emotional topic. As a matter of fact, some of you, I just read this list and some of you got fired up just sitting there with me reading the list. I didn't even give you my opinion on any of it. I didn't have to. You're just all fired up about it. You know, it's, it's emotional for a lot of people and I, I get that. But here's what I want to invite you to do for about two thirds of our time this morning. I want to ask you to be more of a thinker and less of a feeler for the next few minutes. And this is easier for some of you than others. I understand that. But I want to ask you to dial down the emotional And dial up the intellectual for just a little bit. And let's talk about this issue in a little more of a neutral, non-emotional type way. And then at the end, there'll be a a point where you can dial the emotion back up, okay? But for right now, for the next few minutes, let's just think of this from a logical point of view. And I want to start with something that I think we can all agree on. When it comes to identity, I think we can all agree that identity tries to answer the question, who am I? This is all identity is. Who am I? You know, who is it that, that I uh, identify as? Who is it that I feel like I am? And there are two components that make up every person's identity. One is your sense of self, and the other is your sense of worth. Okay? Let me see if I can explain these. So sense of self, that is the part of you that's true of you no matter where you are or what's going on in your world. So there are certain parts of you that are not true of you everywhere. And it's not because you're being hypocritical. This is just reality. For example, you find yourself in certain situations where you need to be more assertive than you normally would be. You find yourself in other situations where you need to demonstrate more empathy than maybe at other times. And so we have different expressions of ourselves based on where we are, what's going on around us. But your actual sense of self, that is the part of you that is true of you no matter where you are, no matter who you're with. It never changes, okay? So that's, that's half of your identity. The other half is your sense of worth. This one's a little easier to understand or wrap your head around. So your sense of worth, that is just your personal belief or assessment 
of your value as a person. Or if I could say it simply, it's how well you like yourself. That's your sense of worth, how much you value yourself. So if you take your sense of self, what parts of me are true of me, no matter where I am or who I'm with, and you take your sense of worth, how much do I like myself, how valuable do I feel like I am, you put those two things together, you get your identity. That is what defines or makes up your identity. But it leads us to the question, well, where do we find our identity? Where do we find that sense of self and where do we find that sense of worth? And this is where everybody goes a different direction, all right? This is where the controversy starts and all the disagreements and all of that, all the emotion enters. This is where it all happens. I'm going to start, there are some different options in terms of how you answer this question. I want to start with the most popular one today, the one that's most current, all right? The most current idea today, when somebody talks about where do they find their identity, the most current idea you hear is you should look inward. You should look inward. Now, let me see if I can explain this one. In our current Western culture, and this is not true in other parts of the world right now, but in our current Western culture, it is seen as heroic whenever you demonstrate self-expression or self-assertion, which is just another way of saying Whenever I feel, and it's actually not true of all desires, which is a bit hypocritical here, but just hang with me. Whenever there are certain desires that I feel inside of me, and I decide it doesn't matter what anybody outside thinks, it doesn't matter what the community thinks, it doesn't matter what other people say, I'm going to be me, I'm going to live out who I am, and you begin to express those desires, you assert your desires, it's seen as heroic and it's often celebrated. Uh, doesn't matter what the desires are, it can be Sexual desires, gender desires, body desires, relational desires, on and on. We could just pick whichever one. Whenever you express those, it's applauded. This is what's most common in America today. This is what's underneath a lot of the conversation and the discussion, the debate that's going on. Everybody should be able to look inward and express whatever desires they have to be whoever it is that they believe they are. And that sounds incredibly freeing. Um, here is the problem with this one. The problem is, it's just actually not rational or logical. That doesn't hold up to the test of life. Let me see if I can explain it. There are a few problems with this. Uh, one is, if I base my identity on all the desires within me, it's not going to take me long to run into discovering my desires inside of me often contradict. I'll give you a simple example. Uh, an individual may have a desire to be independent. It's like, oh my gosh, no matter what happens in my life, I want to be independent. I don't want to count on anybody else. I want to be autonomous. I want to be able to do what I want to do and not have to worry about anybody else. So they have a strong desire for independence. And then they meet somebody who they like a whole lot and they decide, you know what? I want to be committed and married to that person for life. Now I have a desire for independence and I have a desire for a committed marriage relationship. There's a little problem there. And those of you who are married know what that problem is. Independence and marriage are mutually exclusive. They do not work together, do they? Matter of fact, if you maintain your independence when you're trying to be in a marriage relationship, you'll probably never get to marriage because he or she will say, I am done with you. You've got to think about me every now and then, you know? So it just won't work. It just won't work. My point is two desires that are both real inside of a person, but there comes a point where our desires contradict sometimes and we have to pick which one we're going to keep and which one we're going to give up. And if I build my identity around <laughs> desires that are then contradictory with other desires and I have to let go of part of them, I begin to lose my identity. Not only that, but desires inside of me are elusive. Do you have a hard time sometimes figuring out what you actually want? I do. It's like, what do you really want? I, I don't know. I'm trying to figure that out. Sometimes we can't even figure out our own desires. And then we figure them out. And you have to be older to know this, understand this next part. But we figure them out and we think, well, that's it, right? And then 20 years down the road, our desires change. Sometimes two years down the road, our desires change. It's just, I desired it at one point, but I don't desire it anymore. So what happens if I built my identity on the desires within me, but then those desires change? I, I lose my identity. There's one other problem with this, and that is if I'm going to look inward to define who I am, to find my identity, well, that means I don't care about what any of you think. And I want to give you a really extreme example as to why this is not a good idea. Can you imagine 
Can you imagine? Let's go with Hitler, because most everybody can agree that was not a great individual, okay? So let's go with Hitler. Can you imagine Hitler going, you know what? Everybody in the world right now, they all think that I'm a monster, but I'm living by my desires inside of me, so I think I'm a person of incredible worth. I love who I am. Well, you'd, you'd almost have to be mentally unstable to ignore the voices of everybody around you and go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm still good. I'm still fine. I mean, you don't, you don't want to live in a world, actually, where everybody just lives that way and defines their own value and ignores what anybody else thinks. So as freeing as it sounds and as helpful as it sounds, if you decide I'm just going to find my identity by living out and embracing all the desires inside of me, it will create a fracture and fragmentation in your identity eventually. Now, that's a popular view or that's a popular approach right now, but there is a more traditional approach. There's a more traditional alternative and answer to the question, well, where do I find my identity? The more traditional one is, well, you should look outward. Don't look inward. You should look outward, which is just my way of saying, I'm going to look to the community around me and see how the community values me. I'm going to listen to the voices around me and based on what they say I should value and how well I'm lining up with that, well, that'll determine my identity. Traditionally, throughout human history, this has been the most popular one. But again, there are some problems with this. Now, the good news is, or the positive is, we all do need, at times, the affirmation of people around us in terms of helping us to understand who we are. That's a key part of it. But the problem is, if I build my entire identity on the voices of the people around me, I will become dependent and addicted on their approval, which means the minute they withdraw their approval, I lose my identity. Or, and this is even worse, throughout history, and I don't have time to give examples, but throughout history, communities of people have valued different things. The values of communities have changed over time. So if I could take you back to AD 400, well, the community of people around you would have said, here are the things that should be true of you based on what we value. And you could have lived that out and made that your identity. But if you fast forward 400 more years, they would have changed and said it was an entirely different thing and fast forward a thousand years and they would have said it's an entirely different thing. So it's hard to build your identity on something that can change at any moment. It's hard, also hard to build your identity on what other people say you should be because what if they're wrong? Because that often happens. What if they're wrong? So my point is you build your identity on the desires within you and your desires change and you will lose you. You build your identity on the voices or the affirmation of the people around you and they change and you will lose you. This is why the, while both of those scenarios are true you got voices around you you got desires within you you don't want either one of those to be the center of your identity you don't want to anchor your identity to any of that now there is a third door if you will that you can walk through when it comes to identity and this is where I want to introduce Jesus into the conversation because when he showed up Jesus actually taught about identity quite often and in his world, and it's hard for us to understand, but in his first century world, he was introducing a brand new way of thinking about identity. He was introducing a third option that most people in the world had never even considered a possibility. Jesus, when he was here, said, don't look inward and don't look outward and anchor your identity, who you are, to either one of those things. Instead, his invitation was to look upward. Specifically, his invitation was to look at him and to look at his death and resurrection because he taught that his death and resurrection is where all of our identities get anchored. This was fascinating because if you read the teachings of Jesus, you discover a couple of things. Jesus was very clear that how you are is not who you are. In other words, all those desires inside of you and inside of me, I mean, they're a part of us, but they do not define us. Jesus taught, no, no, no. You shouldn't anchor yourself to any of those desires. 
doesn't matter what it is, your gender, sexual, family desires, relational desires, you name it. Don't anchor yourself to any of those. How you are is not who you are. An easy way to, to think about this is let's say that you have a deep, deep desire to be a mom or a dad one day, to have biological children, and you realize over time you can't do that. Well, Jesus' point would be, okay, that is, a, that is a fact and a reality in your life. But your identity is not found in being a mom or dad. How you are, whether you can have kids or not, that's not who you are. None of the desires you have define you. Jesus also taught that what you do doesn't define you. So the accomplishments you have, the achievements you have, the approval you get from other people, the affirmation you get from other people, there are some good parts of that. And that's a reality in all of our lives, but Jesus says you can't let that define you either. Instead, and this was the idea that was so shocking in the first century, and I think it's an idea that's still hard for us to grasp today. But Jesus taught instead whose you are defines who you are. Whose you are defines who you are, which is why he anchored our identities to his death on the cross and then his resurrection. Now, let me see if I can explain this for a few minutes. Actually, I'll let the Apostle Paul explain it. Paul is a brilliant guy, and he's writing to a group of Christians in the region of Galatia, and he's trying to help them understand this identity piece because it's so brand new. And the way Paul described it to them was this. He wrote and he said, but when the set time had fully come, which was his way of saying, when God had everything just the way he wanted it, God sent his son. He's talking about Jesus. God came down to earth and took on a human form, was born as a baby, born of a woman, Born under, Paul says, the law, which is new terminology for some of us. So let me explain this. What Paul is referring to when he talks about the law is this internal moral compass that we all know we have. There's this internal sense of right and wrong, of ought to and not ought to. This is what Paul's referring to. Now, Paul believed that internal compass, if you will, that we all have is something that God gave us, that God wrote that on our hearts, if you will. He, he gave us that internal sense of right and wrong. Now, you may not believe in God, and you may not want to accept any of that's true, and that's fine. You know you have an internal standard. So let's just remove God from the equation for a second. You have your own internal sense of right and wrong, and you know, just like I know, we don't even live up to our own standards, much less God's. But Paul's point is, whenever we break or fail to meet up to that in, inner moral compass that we each have, what does it do when you don't live up to that standard? It creates insecurity and it creates guilt. Why does it create insecurity and guilt? Well, because from Paul's point of view, you have just fractured your identity. It messes with your identity. Anytime your identity does not line up with where it should, there is insecurity and there is guilt. And Paul's explanation for that is this is impacting your identity because your identity is rooted in your creator. And when you don't live up to his standards, you violate or break the relationship you have with your creator. And it opens the door for insecurity, guilt, and identity issues. Which is why he says Jesus showing up on this earth was so important for all of us. He says Jesus came to redeem those under the law. To redeem all of us who didn't meet the standard. Who couldn't live up to that inner moral compass. That we might receive, he says, adoption to sonship. So Paul's point is Jesus showed up to provide a solution for everything we had messed up. He showed up to help clean up all the stuff that we had messed up that we couldn't clean up on our own. He showed up to redeem us, or another way to say that is to reconcile us back to God, to fix the relationship between us and God. Now, this is the part, this is the part that's interesting. This is the part that was hard to fathom. This is the part where you want to turn the emotion back up because it's so emotional. He says Jesus did all of that so that we could be adopted as sons or daughters of our heavenly father. That we could be adopted as sons or daughters of our heavenly father. Now let me explain why this matters so much. Um, some of you get this. Because you have been adopted or you have adopted children. And so you're going to understand this better than some of the rest of us. Um, my situation with my kids is different than your situation with adopted kids. 
because my kids are both biological and I love them to death. But here's what it means. It means I did not get a preview of what they were going to be like before they showed up. They were born and then I learned in real time exactly what they were like. But they were already mine and I couldn't choose a different set of kids. Let me put it another way. If somehow you could have played me a video of some of the sleepless nights over the first two, three, four years before we ever had the kids, I might have said, eh, I'm good. I'm, I'm out. That would have been a terrible decision on my part, but I might have, okay? My point is when you have biological children, you're not, you're not really getting to choose in advance. You don't know what they're like. You're going to figure it out as you go along and you're already committed. Here's what makes adoption so incredibly amazing and powerful. Some of you know this. When you went to adopt your kid, you already had a preview. You may not have known everything, but you already knew about some of the issues. You knew, okay, we're going to have to deal with some abandonment issues or some anger issues or some health challenges or some social challenges, whatever it was. You didn't know everything, but you knew what you were signing up for. You knew the challenges that awaited you. And in spite of all of that, you looked at that child and said, it doesn't matter. I love them anyway. I want them to be part of my family forever. That's remarkable. Let me tell you what's even more remarkable. In the first century world, they refused, other than Christians, nobody else would adopt children because they didn't want to adopt someone they didn't fully know what they were getting. So they would wait until they were adults. This is true. They would wait until they were adults, grown adults, where they got to see exactly how they turned out and what they were getting. And if it was a good one, they'd be like, we want to adopt him into the family, bring him on over. Because there was no risk. This is the point Paul is trying to make to us. Your heavenly father, he knew everything about you. You know all the stuff in your past that you regret, you hope nobody ever talks about, you hope everybody even knows. I don't want them to find out. You know all that stuff you feel guilty about, stuff you'd do over if you could? Listen, your heavenly father knew about all that stuff and he knows about all the stuff you still haven't done yet, but you're going to do. And he, he looked at it all and he said, doesn't matter. That's the one I love. I want to adopt that one as a son or daughter of mine. I know about all the stuff. Doesn't matter. They're so valuable to me. Jesus said, I'll give my life for them so they can have a relationship with me. This is what Paul is referring to. This is why it's so personal. This is why it's so personal. Paul's trying to help us understand that your identity, your identity is not achieved. It's received. Your identity is not based on your desires, what's going on inside of you. It's not based on what's happening around you. Your identity is something that was given to you because your heavenly father looked down and said, that one right there, this is how much you're worth to me. I'll give my life for them. I'm, I'm adopting them. I want to be a son or a daughter of mine. You didn't do anything to earn that. He just offered it to you. And because of that, it's personal. Because of that, Paul goes on and he writes this. He says, because you're his sons and his daughters, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. That word Abba just means daddy. So this is Paul's way of saying, God's not transactional with you. God's not like it works in so many other situations where it's if you do this, then I'll do this. But if you don't, it's not like that. God's personal. He said, no, 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 I, I want you to be a part of my family and I want you to call me dad. This is how your heavenly father approaches you. Now, imagine for just a minute that that was true. And it, you know, you may not believe it's true. That's fine, but let's just play along for a second. Imagine that that was true. Imagine that you knew your heavenly father loved you that much. Imagine that you were absolutely confident you were a son or a daughter of God. How would that change you? How would that change the way you view you? How would that change the way you talk to yourself about you? How would that change what you do? 
How would that change the relationships you get in, the direction you go in life? Because identity determines your destiny. Identity determines where you end up in life. It's that powerful. Imagine how different you would be. Imagine the difference in what you would do, how much more confident you would be to try things, to do things, if you knew you were loved and accepted that way. So my invitation to you today, and this may be hard, but my invitation for you today is to get your identity from a different source. What if you did this? What if you get your view about you from the one who made you, loves you, and redeemed you? What if that's where you got your sense of self and your sense of worth? Because how you are, all the desires inside of you, that's fine. That's a part of life. But how you are is not who you are. And what you do does not define you. Whose you are defines who you are. Now, this is a brand new way of thinking for a lot of us. This is not natural and it is not normal to think this way. What's natural and normal is to listen to our desires or to listen to the voices around us and go, okay, well, I'm, that's where I'm getting my identity. That's just, that's commonplace for all of us today. So if this is new for you, but you're thinking, I would really love to figure out how to get my identity, how to shift the source of my identity and start thinking of myself, getting my view of myself from God instead of all of the other competing voices. I want to give you a simple step to help you get started. And it will not feel natural at first. You're going to have to practice. Like any new habit, it's going to be awkward at first. But I want to give you a simple step. When you came in today, there's a card on your seat. If you're watching online, you just have to write this down. But you got a card on your seat with a statement that I want to invite you to consider reading, maybe praying every morning before you start your day, and maybe every night before you end it. The card just says this. I am who Jesus says I am. I am a created, loved, and redeemed child of God. That is where I'm going to find my identity. I'm going to remember I am a son or daughter of God that God looked down and said, I know everything about that one, and I still love them, and I want to adopt them. It goes on to say, the things that God affirms in me are the true me. In other words, the things about you that line up are in line with God's design for you, the things about you that line up with what Scripture teaches God created you to be, that's the true you. That's part of your identity. On the other hand, the things that he wants to change, those are the parts that aren't who I was created to be. And we all have parts, don't we? But you're like, okay, that does not line up. And typically when, when who we think we are doesn't line up with who God says we're supposed to be, we just try to ignore what God says and you know, rationalize it or justify being who we are. But no, no, no. What if those things that don't line up actually aren't part of your true identity? And you may not know how to change them because, goodness, it feels like it's part of my identity. But if this is actually true, then we can look at God and say, okay, I don't know how to do this, but can you help me figure out how to change this and align this back up with who you created me to be? So if you want to explore this, just start every day, maybe end every day for the next few days, maybe for a few weeks, reminding yourself this is true. Who needs Jesus to define their identity? I think everybody does. And I say that because I don't actually think any of us want to build our identity around desires that will change and cause us to lose ourselves. Or around voices that may change and cause us to lose ourselves. How we are is not who we are. What we do does not define you. Whose you are defines who you are. For some of you, you got a relationship with God, but you just never understood that piece of it, and you got to lean into it. For some of you, this is all brand new to you. You don't know exactly how you could anchor your identity to Jesus' death, where he proved how valuable you were to him, and to his resurrection, which was his way of saying, you can trust me. What I'm telling you about you is true. I am who I claim to be. You don't know how to do that. And the simplest way I know to explain it is this. What Jesus did for you is he looked down and he picked you out knowing everything he knows about you and he said, I want to adopt that one. 
And he died and rose again to make the adoption possible. He signed his part of the adoption papers. He sat out the table and he slid it across to you with a pen. And he says, all you've got to do is sign and you're in. All you've got to do is sign and you're part of my family. Some of you have never taken the step to do that. And all you got to do is sign. All you got to do is say, I want what you're offering, Jesus. I want to be a son or a daughter of yours. And you will be a new person with a new identity from this point forward. Let me pray for us. Father, this is so difficult to do because it's just natural for us to listen and look inward or to listen and look outward. It's what's common. It's what everybody does. And yet it, it leaves us always uncertain and unstable because uh, we're not centering our identity, anchoring it to something that doesn't change. So would you help us to get our view about ourselves from you, the one who made us and loves us and redeemed us. For those who've never signed those adoption papers, so to speak, would you, in this moment, help them to see it's so simple and easy. If they'll just accept the free gift of forgiveness and become a part of your family that you're offering them. Jesus, we thank you for showing us how much we're worth to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you'd like more content like this, subscribe to our YouTube channel and download our Journey app to access all of our recent message content. And our app is the easiest way to share this content with friends. For more information on our church or to find our app or our YouTube channel, just visit journeycalway.com. That's journeycalway.com. Thanks for listening.